lost some good friends along life's way some loved ones departed in heaven to say but thank god i didn't lose everything i've lost faith in people who said they'd care in the time of my crisis they would never Disappointment in my season of pain. One thing never wavered, one thing never changed. I never lost my hope. Mm. I never lost my joy. I lost my focus and went astray, but thank God I didn't lose everything. I lost possessions that were so dear, and I
morning, church family. Good morning. Today's scripture reading will be taken from Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 15. In those days, when, I'm just playing, I'm just playing. I'll give you more time than that. <laughs> All right, for real this time. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebrew Jews about because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man of faith and the Holy Spirit. Also, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of, the God, so the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from the members of the synagogue of the freed men, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces as Cilicia and Asia. These men began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against his wisdom or the spirit by whom he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, we have heard Stephen speak words of blasphemy against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified, this fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say, that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the, hand, in the Sanhedrin intently looked at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like that of an angel. May God bless the reading of his word. Amen. Father, thank you so much for allowing us uh, to be here this morning. Thank you for giving us your word, and I pray, Lord, that as the Spirit of God would use your word this morning that he may speak to each heart those who are christians help us lord in our responsibility and our commitments to each other and to you and then for that person who doesn't know your savior bring them to salvation today we pray for christ's sake amen a young single preacher was appointed pastor and preached a message entitled 10 facts on how to raise perfect children. Well, he soon got married, and a few years after they had their first child, he decided to preach the old sermon again, but this time he changed the title from 10 Facts on How to Raise Perfect Children to 10 Suggestions on How to Raise Healthy Children. A few years after the second child was born, he decided to preach the sermon again, this time, he changed the title, 10 Possibilities for, Pairing children, for Parenting Children. Well, the third child came, and he decided to preach the message again. This time, he revised the entire title, and he called it, 10 Prayers for Parents. <laughs> Several years later, when the kids were now teenagers, he decided to preach it again, but this time he said he better just burn the message and he wrote a brand new message entitled, Help Me Jesus. <laughs> I think by now we have all figured out that there are no perfect children. Somebody say amen. amen. And because there are no perfect children, there are no perfect adults, and that's why there is no perfect church. So as Brother Sam used to say back in the day, he said, if you ever find a perfect church, what would he say? Run! 
Because he said, if you join, you're going to mess it up. Leave it alone. Acts chapter 2 to Acts chapter 5 introduces us to the excitement of the early church. People were being saved by the thousands in that space of time. Acts chapter 2, you remember, it started with 3,000. And last year, we, last week, we realized that in Acts chapter 5, there were now over 5,000 men and in imagination and there must have been more than 15,000 in just that short space of time. The church was growing incredibly. Even the religious leaders were being saved, believe it or not. Incredible miracles were being done. Acts chapter 5 verse 15 tells us people brought their sick into the street. And just Peter's shadow falling on these people healed them. Folks were so moved by the Holy Spirit, and you better believe this had to be a movement of the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us they were so moved. People were selling their houses and land and bringing the proceeds to be used for the work of God. You know that had to be a movement of the Spirit. Amen? What an exciting time. What an exciting church to belong to. How could anything go wrong in a church like that where the Spirit of God was moving so mightily? But I have come to find out wherever the Spirit of God is at work, you can expect the devil to show up. Satan is not about to roll over or play dead because the Spirit is at work. And he attacks from all sides. He causes outsiders to attack the church. But he's also developed great skill in getting the church to shoot itself internally. And in Acts chapter 6 and in Acts chapter 7, we find the church under attack both internally and externally. And today I want to look at these two chapters of the book of Acts as I share with you a message entitled, The Church Under Fire. The Church Under Fire. We have heard the term friendly fire. And what friendly fire is. Friendly fire is when soldiers accidentally fire on their own comrades. But what? happens sometimes in churches today is so unfriendly that we cannot call this friendly fire. We've got some unfriendly fire in the church today. Am I right about that? And so this morning, as we share this message, the church on the fire, I want first of all to share with you four sources of internal fire. The first, ethnic or cultural differences. Ethnic or cultural differences. And here we have uh, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 6, verse 1. And the Word of God says, In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. One group, the Grecian Jews, complained against the Hebraic Jews, and the word their complain is the word that means murmuring. Despite the incredible movement of the Holy Spirit, there was an undercurrent going on in the early church. Negative stuff was passing through the grapevine. And would to God that as we have come into God's house this morning, we're open, opening our hearts to the Word of God, and if we are part of a murmuring, and I thank God I, I can preach freely because I don't know of any murmuring. So let's, let's just say, oh, he must be picking on something. I know of no murmuring, but God wants to warn us because the devil, as the Spirit of God is working, and there is no doubt the Spirit of God is at work amongst us, but you had better believe that the devil, 
devil is not pleased that God is at work. And what happens when God is at work, that there are these differences, and what happened here in the church, there was a murmuring. Something started going on in the grapevine. Now, it's interesting. This was not a dispute between Jews and the, and the Gentiles. This was a dispute between Jews and Jews. Some were born in Israel and spoke Aramaic, while others were born in other countries and they spoke primarily Greek. Greek was their primary language. And although it was Jew and Jew, they found a reason to divide. Isn't it amazing how we can always find a reason to divide? GCA, I, I, I want us to take this seriously. Because there is something, listen, there is something inherently wrong with us as human beings because we are always finding a reason to divide. We divide on color. We divide on social la class. We divide on country of origin. Some churches divide on wine, on wine versus grape juice. You better believe it. Did, did you know that? One group said it should be wine. One group said it's grape juice. And so they split. One group said it should be bread. One group said it should be matzo for the breaking of bread. So they split. Something in us is always seeking a reason to divide. And one day, I wonder if I'm speaking to somebody uh, this morning who, who, who has a, something in them that you're trying to divide. You feel that perhaps you might be a little better than somebody else. You know, the, the, these crazy, you know, this stuff makes us do some crazy things. Cheryl and I, we were in Vietnam and we, um, we had hired a, a, a bicycle, motorbike, right, a tour. Uh, so this is quite exciting. If you, ever go, if you ever go to a country that has this, you may want to try it. So here we were on these little scooters, and these young ladies were our tour guides. And so, uh, you know, here I am on the back of this scooter. But bef when we got there, we noticed that everybody had on, it must have been about 90 degrees, everybody had on long sleeves and gloves, and, and, and they, of course they had on, and we noticed everybody who was leaving during the tour. So we said to the young lady, why does everybody have on long sleeve? Why do you all have on jackets and it's so hot? She says, because we want our skin to be white. <laughs> no, from where I stood, I thought they were pretty light skinned. <laughs> but, but you see, the culture says that the lighter the skin is, the better you are. So, so, so what they had to do, they had to make sure they protected themselves from all sunlight so the skin uh, maintain, maintain its whiteness. And then, of course, you would have there all these advertisements because you have to do all you can to bleach, to become as white as you possibly can be. The stuff makes us do crazy things. A young person, if we're not careful, there are people who have made some of our young people believe they're not as good as somebody else. But listen, young person, I want you to know that you are not inferior to anyone. You bear the image of God. Every human being in this place and on this planet bears the image of God and there is nobody that is superior to you. Amen? Amen. They're not superior and you are certainly not superior to them. We're all unique. We've got our own fingerprints. We've got our own talents. We've got our own abilities. God has made every single one of us special. And I don't want any of you young people to ever forget that. If your mama hasn't told you that, just remember today that Pastor Brian is saying to you, you are special. You're made in the image of God. 
But oh, that God might help us to not be wanting to divide. Oh, I don't like his accent. I don't understand his accent. Listen, if you're part of the family of God, you had better try to understand. You know, the, the, interestingly, you may think because I'm married to the choir director, I know what the choir is going to sing. But it's always interesting uh, to come to hear what the choir is singing. And one of the songs says, we're all part of God's family. Amen? You are important to me. I need you to serve. Oh, come on, brothers and sisters at GCA. Do we really mean that? Do you really mean that? Do you really feel like you to survive? Or do you You are so talented. You have got it all together. I want you to know you need me. And I need you. We are part of God's family. And listen good. You are closer to me if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. You are closer to me than your blood relative who doesn't know Jesus. I hope you recognize that. And it doesn't matter. Some folks don't like this race and that race. It doesn't matter what race you are from. We are part of God's family. God has united us in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. He has baptized us into the one body of Christ. I know I'm so thankful that I'm a part of the wonderful family of God. What was the apostles' response? Here they have this drama going on in the church. The murmuring is going through the grapevine. One saying, uh, we are being left out. You all are playing favorites. First, they acknowledged the problem. I'm going to give you three very simple things, obvious things. But as I prepared, I realized, the Spirit of God wanted me to emphasize three simple things that every single one of us know because it is possible that although we know them, we don't do them. Number one, first they acknowledge the problem. The worst thing we can do is to know there's a problem and to do nothing. Do you know that some Christians believe the way to solve a problem is to get a broom and to what? Sweep it under the rug. It will go away. Let's just sweep it under the rug. And so guess what? The rug just gets more lumpy. Some folks' rug has a huge bulge because everything is under the rug. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. The word of God says there in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. As see to it, and I think it's up there on the screen, that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. I don't want you to miss something very simple that's in this verse. Notice what it says. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root, what? Grows up. Here is the danger of what, of what happens when we sweep things under the rug. We allow the root to do what? To grow up. God wants us to deal with the problem when it first manifests. Don't allow the root to grow. You notice what the word of God says? It says, because if you allow it to grow up, it will cause trouble and defile what? Many. The problem is we don't take care of stuff and by the time it's all over a whole ton of people 
have been affected. And I want to encourage you, my friend, because, you know, it is impossible for so many people to be in a church rubbing shoulders and nobody ever gets offended or gets their feelings hurt. But I want to encourage you from this day to make a commitment to God and say, God, I am going to commit to you that I am not going to allow a root of bitterness to grow up. God, I am going to stop sweeping stuff under the rock. If you're here this morning and you're hurt, Somebody has hurt you, or the leaders have hurt you, or whatever has happened. Resolve, we, I am going to get it fixed. I am going to deal with it. Can you say amen? amen. But not only did they acknowledge the problem, but the leaders also determined the solution. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 6, verses 2 to 5, it tells us what they did. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the Word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and to the ministry of the word of God. The apostles prayerfully devised the solution and they realized that the solution had to give priority to the ministry of the word and to prayer. The apostles devised a solution. Spent a whole message there, but I won't. There is also... A recommendation as to how you can fix any interpersonal problem. Third, they took action. And so in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 6, verse number 5, we read this. This proposal pleased the whole group. And so they choose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, a Philip and Prochorus and Nicana and Timon and Parmenas and Nicholas from Antioch. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. They took action. The problem was only resolved because they took action. Oh, this is so simple, but I don't want you to miss it. The problem was only resolved because they took action. You can know about problems. You can feel the problem. You can be part of the problem. You can know the solution to the problem. But if you do nothing, the problem will never get fixed. I've discovered that Christians often know exactly what the solution is, but they will sit and do nothing. The early church decided they were going to do something. Oh, I hope this morning the Spirit of God will talk to us. Amen? The early church had quickly and successfully dealt with this first conflict. This is the first conflict the book tells us about. And they had quickly and successfully dealt with it. But soon the church uh, took the easy route. They started allowing things to fester and remain unresolved. And so by the time we get to the epistles, we see some more uh, problems coming up. And I want to quickly this morning uh, just talk about three of them before I move on. Number sec So the second cause of internal fire, interpersonal conflicts. Interpersonal conflicts. Turn with me uh, to the book of Philippians. Philippians. Philippians chapter 4, and I'm just going to read two verses for you there, uh, verses 2 and 3 of Philippians chapter 4. Uh, he says here, uh, I plead with Yodia and I plead with Syntyche to agree with each other in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, loyal yoke fellow, help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Can you imagine? These women were not bench warmers. 
These women were spiritual, mature women who had worked with Paul in spreading the gospel. These women had contended, as the King James puts it, they had contended for the gospel. You would think, come with me now. You know, sometimes we make the mistake of thinking problems only result from those who are not spiritually mature. If that's your belief, you better think again. Because sometimes the challenges happen among the spiritually mature. Because sometimes the spiritually mature are very reluctant. Because I am so knowledgeable in the things of God. I'm so learned in the things of God that I won't fix anything. And this is why there are a lot of problems, believe it or not, on the mission field. People who have given their lives to Jesus. Did you know there are a lot of interpersonal problems on the mission field? This conflict went unresolved for so long. Paul had to write about it. Christians sometimes treat interpersonal conflicts as if they don't matter. Ah, we are about ministering the word of God. We are into ministering the word of God. Who needs to be worried about the interpersonal conflicts? But Paul realized that these conflicts are harmful to the church. Now let's let's can we can I give you a practical illustration? So let's uh, let's assume GCA has now announced evangelism day. Okay. Now, if uh, Yodi and Sinteke were here, guess what? Sinteke would go to the sign-up sheet in the lobby to see if Yoda signed up. And if Yoda signed up, Sinteke says, I won't do that ministry because I don't want to get too close to her. I got a problem with her. Do you see how this thing works? Do you realize in our church, if you don't fix problems, you have a tendency to want to see who is leading that ministry, who is involved in that ministry, and you make a determination based on whether you're getting along with that person or not. Listen, God has a solution. He says, fix it. And I'm praying this morning that as the Spirit of God works in our hearts, we would start realizing that the most dangerous type of fire Against the church, remember now our message title is what? The church under fire. The most deadly fire against the church is the fire that's happening on the inside. It's not the outside fire. The most dangerous and damaging fire to God's church is what happens on the inside when Christians are shooting each other. You say, oh, I'm not shooting anybody. You are shooting when you fail to take care of business. Second problem, interpersonal conflict. Do you have results? You know, the Bible tells us what to do. Listen, if you don't know, go to Matthew. It down. Matthew 18, 15 to 17. Matthew 18, 15 to 17. God gives you the prescription, the steps to follow to resolve interpersonal conflict. Ephesians 4, 3. Before I move on, Ephesians 4, 3. Here's what Ephesians 4, 3 says. It says what? Read it with me. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Brothers and sisters, I just want to ask you this morning. Do you have any interpersonal conflict? And here's a question. Are you making every effort to keep the unity? I, I, I hope you notice what God says. He didn't say to, to create the unity. You see, God is trying to get across. The unity has already been created. The Spirit of God has created. You see, He has already made us one. The question is, what are you going to do to maintain it? He says, make every effort to keep that unity. And might God help you this morning if you have been a re 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 rebellious Christian. Because, you know, it's interesting how much the Bible talks about these issues. 
It's all over the New Testament because God knows that if we hear it one time, we're going to resist. But my God help you this morning. Perhaps you're one of those uh, like Yodi and Syntyche. You are true co-laborers in the gospel. You're contenders for the gospel. But you know either somebody has hurt you or you have hurt somebody. And you know there's a tension. God is saying to you, won't you this morning fix it? Won't you make every effort so that the unity of the Spirit might be maintained? But the third problem that I want to bring to your attention is a desire for preeminence. A desire for preeminence. And in 3 John uh, chapter nine, verse 9, 3 John verse number 9, and we're going to put it on the board for you, but in 3 John chapter, verse number 9, it's only one chapter, uh, 3 John verse number 9, uh, the Word of God says, Diotrephes, who loves to be what? To be first, will have nothing to do with us. Diotrephes was a type of person who would get bent out of shape uh, if his name wasn't mentioned. If the church didn't properly recognize him and make a big deal about him, uh, Diotrephes would be upset. Do you know this is, this is a very difficult type of person to handle? Because this person, uh, you know, it, 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 you have to be so careful what you say or don't say about Mr. Diotrephes. And I get the impression uh, that the Apostle John must have spoken to Diotrephes about his damaging attitude. So guess what Diotrephes did? I just have nothing to do with him. Diotrephes just decided, listen, this is the Apostle John. I mean, you see all the miracles that are happening through the hands of the Apostle John. And Diotrephes, Mr. Big Shot, he didn't like clearly what John had to say. He just cut him off. Sadly, the spirit of Diotrephes is still in the church today. And if you have the spirit of Diotrephes, ask God to help you. Oh, it's so much better if you ask God to help you rather than to have us come to talk to you. Because it's always an ugly thing. It's an ugly conversation when you have to talk to diatrophies. So may God help you. Amen? Don't let Satan cause you to be the cause of unfriendly fire. But fourth, so what have we said so far? We have said that one of the problems is ethnic or cultural differences. Amen? And now uh, we, we are saying that one of the big problems is uh, deserting the local fellowship. Deserting the law, the local fellowship. Second Timothy chapter four, verses nine and ten. And here's what the word of God tells us in Second Timothy chapter four, verse nine and ten. Be diligent to come to me quickly. For what? Demas. It's on the board there. For Demas has what? Having loved this present world and has departed for Thessalonica. Now, just so you know this. Uh, Paul uh, was, uh, knew Demas very well. In fact, Paul mentions Demas in the books of Colossians and Philemon. So in three different epistles, Demas is mentioned. Don't you for a minute believe De Demas was just a come-to-Jesus Christian, a uh, recently Christian. Demas was around. Demas was a co-laborer of Paul. And he's mentioned in three different epistles. So you can imagine the pain in Paul's heart as he writes, Demas has forsaken me. Now the word, the Greek for the word forsaken doesn't mean that Demas had just left. The word for forsaken means that Demas had abandoned, that he had left him in the lurch. Can you imagine? This man walked, this man is your co-laborer, he's active in ministry, and suddenly he just disappears without any explanation. Do you know that still happens? Uh, did, did, did you realize that still happens? People just walk away. And listen, this is not a pistol shot. 
particularly if the person is active in ministry. This is not a pistol shot to the church. This is a cannon shot. When somebody who is active in ministry, without any explanation, without any warning, they just disappear. And I'm going to encourage you, my brothers and sisters, listen, there are going to be issues among us as believers. We're not going to all agree. Can we agree that we won't all agree on everything? If we all agree on everything at all times, somebody's unnecessary. Because you might not realize it, that one of the things that creates growth is disagreement. If handled well, that, that dynamic, you see organizations where everybody agrees, never grows. Growth needs some disagreement. If it's properly handled, we can be motivated and we can grow. But listen, so there will be disagreements. We can bet on that. But listen, let's make sure when the disagreements come, don't just walk away. If you do, you are contributing to taking a cannon shot on God's church. Enough about internal fire. He said, Brother Brian, don't tell us any more about internal fire. We, we got it, we got it, we got it, we got it. Do, 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 do you have we really gotten it? It's bad. It's disastrous. And the problem is, it can be avoided and fixed. So let's talk about external fire. Because external fire, as terrible as it is, it often achieves a divine purpose. You see, what the devil designs for evil, God can use for his glory. Amen? And that's the beauty about external fire. And in fact, we're going to see as we go through Acts chapter 6 and 7, and you need not worry, we're not going to go through the whole Acts 6 and 7. But as we touch on the highlights here and, and look at the dramatic story of Stephen, you're going to see that God used the external fire for his purposes. And so, of course, we know that Stephen was one of the seven deacons because we believe these seven men who were appointed in Acts chapter 6, just so you know where GCA stands, we believe that this is, the, this is the, 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 the beginning of where deacons are found in the church. And so uh, Stephen was one of the seven deacons, and he was now about to become the first Christian martyr. Stephen would be the first person who would be killed for the resurrected Christ. And as we study this story very briefly, I want you to just look with me at four benefits that we can see from uh, Stephen's story. Number one, it shows, external fire shows that we are living for God. R turn with me please to Acts of the Apostles chapter 6, verse 8 through 14. The Bible says, Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and miracles, miraculous signs among the people. Opposition arose, however. And verse 11, They secretly persuaded some men to say, We have heard speak, and speak words of blasphemy against Moses and against God. Listen, Stephen was preaching and teaching in the power of the Spirit of God, and, and, and it, it, it upset them so much, and the only way they could find a way against him was to lie. I want you to hold your, you hold your finger in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 6, while you turn to 1 Peter, chapter 4. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 6, while you turn to 1 Peter, chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. And verse number 15 says there, if you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or as a thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed. But praise God that you bear that name. Amen. 
if you suffer for doing evil, listen to me now, if you suffer for doing evil, don't say you are experiencing external fire. Do you hear what I'm saying? If you suffer for doing evil, realize you're getting the strap. Do you know what the strap is? It's God's chest. You see, external fire is when we suffer because we're living for God. And the apostle, uh, as he writes there uh, in 1 Peter, he says, One God that you're suffering for him. Another benefit of external fire, it allows us to reflect God's glory. Don't lose your spot in 1 Peter, but here in Acts of the Apostles chapter 6, here's what it says here in verse number 15. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen and they saw that his face was what? Like the face of an angel. Wow. Wow. And so as a result of this, Stephen now gets the opportunity in Acts chapter 7 to powerfully proclaim the word of God. And many times when we are caught in external fire, it creates opportunities for us to, to, to magnify the name of Jesus. Amen? You remember Paul and Silas in prison, and they were imprisoned, but, 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 but God gave them an opportunity uh, to preach to the Philippian jailer. And the jailer came running in. What must I do to be saved? External fire often brings about divine purposes. So here we are in 1 Peter. Did you, did you hold that in your, with your finger? 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 14. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. Here's what it says. For the spirit of what? The spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Did you see that? The spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Listen, the second benefit of external fire, it allows us to reflect God's glory. The third, it draws us closer to the Lord. God wants us to get to the point in our lives when it's all about Jesus. Amen? That's where Stephen was. And so here we are in Acts of the Apostles chapter 7. You see, I skipped all the way to chapter 7 verse 54. Say amen if you're glad I skipped all the way there. <laughs> Acts of the Apostles chapter 7 verse 54. It says here, when they heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at, Pete, at Stephen. Stephen had proclaimed to them the gospel and their responsibility of, of, of not accepting Jesus and turning their back to him, on him and crucifying him. And when they heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. When we are caught in external fire, it draws us closer to the Lord. Stephen not only saw the glory of God, but he saw Jesus standing. You know, the picture the New Testament gives us is of a Jesus who is what? Seated at the right hand. But no, Stephen, as he is going through his fire, he doesn't see a seated Jesus. He sees a standing Jesus. And Jesus is standing, I believe, for many purposes, but I just want to believe as I use my sanctified imagination that Jesus is about to welcome the martyr home. That Jesus is saying, well done! My friend, sometimes before we hear that well done, sometimes it's going to mean that we're going to be subject to external fire. 
Sometimes it means that you and I, as believers in Jesus Christ, will have to be counted. And so the question is, when, if that were me, would I be willing to stand up and be counted? External fire may cost us. And oh, to, would God help us to understand that? Because we're living in a day and an age when Christianity has become something that you accept so that you get a ticket to an easy life, a ticket to a full bank account, a ticket to good health, a ticket to heaven. But I want you to know that what God has called us to is, a call, is discipleship. And there is indeed a cost of discipleship. So what should we do when we are challenged, when our tough time comes? I'm not going to take the time to read it, but I encourage you to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And I'm just going, in fact, I'm going to go there just for a little because I think I need to go there. Oh, you will just have to excuse me because I'm going to run just a few minutes over. I'm not going to take you long. But 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I want to read these verses because our tough time, I'm probably speaking to somebody who right now you're going through external fire look at what it says here in Corinthians chapter 4 uh, and I'm going to turn you first uh, to verse number 7 2nd Corinthians 4 verse but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the all-surpassing power is from God and not for us here's what the Apostle Paul says are you listening to me this morning if you're with me say amen he says, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned. God will never abandon us, struck down, but not destroyed. Nothing, but nothing will be able to destroy us. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake. Listen, uh, listen, my young person, young person, young person. God has given us something to live for and if needs be, to die for. I, I hope that's how you feel. Christian friend, I hope you believe that this Jesus is worth living for, but that he's worth dying for. Amen. Amen. And so as we go on and we get to verse number 16, he, the apostle says, Therefore, we do not lose heart, no matter how tough things are, my believer in Jesus Christ, when external fire comes, when you're Called, called on to make a stand for God. The apostle says, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, though outwardly there's trouble on every hand, but he said, yet we are being renewed. We are being drawn closer to Jesus for our light and Momentary troubles. The apostles say, all oh, the drama that I'm experiencing for the sake of Christ. And you all know the story of Paul. All he went through. And the apostle Paul, as he looks on all he had suffered, he says, this is a light and a momentary trouble. Achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporal, but what is unseen is eternal. Oh, I thank God. We've got something that is bigger than all the temporal stuff. We've got some eternal benefits waiting for us in heaven. But oh, thank God that these trials, these external fires will do something special in your life and mine. But then finally, these trials achieves. Don't miss this. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, verse 1. On that day, the very day, Stephen was martyred for Jesus. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. Verse 4. 
those who had been scattered. They were scattered. Verse 1 tells you they were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. And those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. You remember what Jesus had said in Acts of the Apostles chapter 1? You shall what? Receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon me. You and you shall be witnesses to me where? In Jerusalem. In where? Judea. And in Samaria. And to the uttermost parts of the world. And so in Acts chapter 1. To Acts chapter 6. We have a church on the move. But a church on the move in Jerusalem. Stephen gets killed. And all of us. Christians are scattering. People are running all over the world. They're going to Judea. They're going to Samaria. They're going to go to the uttermost parts of the world because God is using external fire to achieve his purpose. And then finally, that before I mean it now, I can't, I can't stop. I can't leave you there. I can't leave you. I have to at least go to verse 57 to 60 of Acts chapter 7. Verse 57. At this they covered their ears and yelling at the horses, they, they, they rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laced their, their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Next week we're going to talk about Saul. Impacted by grace is our message next week. I hope you'll come and bring a friend. There were stoning him. Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Thank God he didn't die. You realize it? In asleep on earth. And he woke up in heaven. Can you, can you put yourself in the picture? The stones. What a way to go. The stones. Have you ever been stoned? Just think of it. Stones are pelting the man. Rocks. As I would say when I was a boy. Rock stone. Rock. Bleeding. And they just kept pouring it on. He's weakened. He's on his knees. And the stones keep coming. Please don't lay. Does it remind you of anybody else? Or does this remind you of Jesus? He is being brutally treated. And he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. These people didn't want to hear Stephen's message. Perhaps you came in to please somebody, but you didn't really want to hear the message. But no, it doesn't change anything. Jesus, his life for you. He died to save you from your sin. Listen, that's story that story shows what we are really like without Jesus it shows almost how I really want to spar with God God I am satisfied with the way I am the Bible says they stop their ears 
just think of how silly that was. All these adult men. And they're rushing with their ear. The Spirit of God is speaking to you this morning. And he's saying, I died. Jesus is saying, I died for you. To open your heart and say, Lord Jesus, come into me. Come into day. Come into day. My heart. Lord Jesus. Every head bowed. Every eye. My friend, your head is bowed. Your eyes are closed. Will you take Jesus? Or will you take your ears? your ears from hearing the message right now the Spirit of God is touching at somebody's heart he's touching he's touching you and he's saying I'm talking to you this is for you this salvation is for you yes I died for you when I said father forgive them for they know not. I was really talking to my father about you I was asking him to forgive you the question is, will you respond to this love and say, Lord Jesus, I come today. Anyone like that? You want the Lord Jesus to know you want him to save you today. You raise your hand right now. Anyone like that today? You just raise your hand right now as we pray. Christians are praying for you. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. You raise your hand right now. But you're raising your hand, you're saying, Brother Brian, pray for me. I want Jesus Christ to be my savior today. I'm so thankful that he said, Father, forgive them. Willing to forgive me. No matter what you have done, he will forgive you. Final call, anyone like that today? Anyone like that today? Father, thank you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for making us part of this one body of Christ. Treasure. Not treat this lightly that we may not continue trying to be individuals but that we might leave here this morning at least getting the picture that we are part of this one body of Christ let us do everything then to make sure we're doing our part to keep the unity of the spirit where there are those who have challenges with other members of this church family or other members of Christians in other places please Lord help them to fix it for those, Lord, who might be going through persecution, external fire, Lord, help them to realize that you have your eyes on them.